Okay, this is the first defensive wall, if you like, uh, around Navan Fort. This is where the high kings of Ulster would have lived up above us. And there would have been people lived outside of this rampart. They would have kept their cattle out there and grazed the cattle out there. But at the first sign of danger, they would have brought them through here and, and up the steps. So this well, is like one big been, ring of defence. It's a ring all the way around, the whole way around the, the Navan Fort. Their main homes would have been inside the defence. There were several of these homes for the royal clan. Dominating the top was a massive banqueting hall, where the warriors of Ulster spent their time drinking, boasting and challenging each other, entertained by musicians. The king held court here and religious ceremonies took place. The expansive views from this high site over this whole region, one understands its symbolic significance. Whoever commanded this site commanded the whole region. With the growing importance of Christianity, the seat of power shifted to nearby Armagh because St. Patrick built his church on a sweet little hill right here. St. Patrick was a diplomat. He knew that in order to win the people over, he had to go after the people in power. So Patrick visited Tara and then he came to Owen Mahal, where the High Kings of Ulster were, and decided, OK, well, this is the place I'm going to build my first cathedral, which he actually built a church on the hill in Armagh. And there's an unbroken line of bishops from the time of Patrick right up to today. As a result, this, our smallest and oldest city, boasts not one, but two St. Patrick's cathedrals and two primates of all Ireland. One Catholic, one Church of Ireland. This is the Catholic Cathedral, which was built in 1840 on an elevated site. The city has an elegant urban atmosphere with intact streetscapes and a wealth of fine Georgian architecture surrounding its large green mall. Richard Robinson, the Bishop Robinson, was responsible for the building of George and Armagh. He would have done a lot of work in um, raising the standard of living for people in Armagh. I'm curious about this Archbishop. He was the Protestant one, by the way, and I'm off to see his palace, a fashionable piece of architecture in its time. Apart from the buildings, there's a large domain with gardens, woodlands, and open vistas. There are walks and an eco-trail in the woods, so you can ramble for hours. The Archbishop's Palace is now home to Armagh City Council, who have their offices in these elegant buildings. The palace stables are used for exhibitions, and many artefacts from bygone days are displayed here, bringing the past alive. Ten minutes nearby, I discovered the Lurgaboy Adventure Centre, which offers a range of outdoor activities. Richard Duggan, who developed it, is also an expedition leader and a bit of an adventurer himself. The centre itself is named after the local townland, Lurgaboy, and uh, the premises are set in about 35 acres of land. Uh, we can cater for up to 18 people in total and we've got a huge amount of activities. We run archery, we run canoeing, we run kayaking, we run climbing, upsailing courses, and uh, we have a, a huge range of uh, team building events as well. I love the great outdoors, and my passion would be climbing mountains, and I've organized and led uh, over 15 major expeditions across the world, uh, and without a doubt, the biggest of them all was climbing Mount Everest. Before setting up this business, I used to work as a surveyor in Belfast with a conservation company. These buildings happen to date back to the, to the late 1700s, and I, from the moment I, I seen them, I fell in love with the buildings. They had a certain amount of charm about them. Structurally, they were very sound, I, so I decided to restore these, these buildings. More and more houses are being constructed, and these houses, rather than blending into the countryside like these old historic buildings, they stand out because they don't use traditional local materials. 
I would definitely encourage people to restore an old building because the rewards are absolutely massive. Everything we've been looking at here could be described as ecotourism, which is a bit of a buzzword. I've been trying to find out what it really means. Our carbon footprint has become far too big for all of us in the developed world. My enjoyable trip to South Armagh is about this size, whereas the carbon footprint for a short trip to Europe is about this size. Our emissions are not sustainable for the future. They're about the size of this fellow. My train journey to Newry produced three kilograms of CO2. I could have gone by car, in which case it would have been 40 kilograms. Compare this with the flight to Spain, which is more than half a tonne. That's over 500 kilograms per seat. This region is relatively undiscovered and ideally suited to sustainable ecotourism. Una Walsh, a storyteller and community activist, is passionate in her belief that this is the way to go. Una, can you tell us about this area of South Armagh? Well, I imagine from, uh, for somebody that's living in Dublin, it has to be a completely different world. It has to be almost as if they've stepped back in time and not in a way that's developed around leprechauns or something like that, but just in the whole thing of how unspoiled it has remained. What we would hope is that the tourism that happens isn't allowed to spoil the area, that we work in this new type of ecotourism so that the people that are coming in, the people that are living here, the environment, all of it's allowed to work together. Doing our bit for the environment doesn't have to mean suffering or radically changing our lifestyles. It's possible to make a real difference by just being more aware of the impact we're personally responsible for and making small adjustments to reduce that impact. Over the last few days, I certainly didn't suffer. Thank you.